This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Paul Clemens. Yes, Paul, he played the lead in The Beast Within. He will be my third guest from that classic. I had Catherine Moffat on last year for the 40th anniversary. Yeah, oh, it's going to be awesome. And um, yeah, I mean, he's Hollywood royalty. You know, Eleanor Parker was his mother, you know, from The Man with the Golden Arm, Sound of Music, so many great movies. And uh, Paul, you know, he worked, he did, uh, he was in the war movie The Passage with Anthony Quinn and uh, James Mason. He was in uh, Promises in the Dark with Marsha Mason. He guest starred on Quincy. Uh, He was in um, a cult classic of mine I love. They're playing with fire with another guest of mine, Eric Brown. And it's going to be a great conversation today. You know, he's also a Edgar Allan Poe scholar. He's an expert on the paranormal. And he's also worked for Anchor Bay. Oh, I got to ask about that. I love Anchor Bay and their reissues of my favorite cult movies. It's going to be a great conversation today. It's the last full week of Halloween October. I got two more days two or three more days coming up worth of guests and you're all gonna love it this has been a fantastic month nice and easy no pressure and it's been nothing but fun so yeah here is my interview with paul clemens hello hey paul welcome to the show how are you today i am doing all right how are you man I am fantastic. I can't tell you what a great honor this is. Thank you so much for taking the time today. Well, you're very uh, welcome, Tommy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, going back in time, I can imagine growing up the son of legendary actress Eleanor Parker that it was only natural that you would gravitate toward acting as well. Uh, Yeah, it it, kind of was. (laughs) Yes, (laughs) very much so. Yeah, so did you get involved in school plays and community theater and all of that? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, oh, I sure did. Um, and uh, um, it was it, when I was at a certain age, it was sort of a toss-up yeah. between whether I, whether I was going to be an actor or a makeup artist. And uh, but as you know, as a stage actor, uh, I really you know, was able to combine both. And uh, yeah, my um, my favorite actor uh, at that point as a kid was uh, Lon Chaney Sr. and uh, all the you know amazing characters he was able to uh, assemble out of that amazing uh, makeup kit of his, and uh, and of course with his uh, astonishing uh, variety, uh, you know his his acting talent. So uh, um, my mother was uh, a great inspiration, uh, and so was. Cheney, and so I, I thought it very fitting, um, because of her versatility, uh, that years later, when a book was written about her, mm-hmm. uh, it was it was titled Eleanor Parker, Woman of a Thousand Faces. Oh, that's great! Yeah, because she really was, you know. I mean, she was very versatile in the roles that she played. Yeah, it was. It's interesting. Um, a lot of people at the time, um, not not people she worked with, but the regular you know movie going audience at that time, uh, they weren't really used to that. Uh, at least not in the talking era. And uh, <clears throat> Cheney had been gone some time at that point, and uh, a lot of emphasis had been put uh, in terms of you know the golden age of Hollywood. A lot of emphasis was put on glamour, and that didn't mean that much to my mom. Uh, only if it was important for the character. And uh, glamour for the sake of glamour never, you know, held that great an interest for her, even though she was, because of her physical beauty, was able to pull that off. But uh, she was far more interested in playing a a range of characters, uh, you know, having nothing to do with the the glamorous aspects of things, but the the truth of the character. And, uh, And she became so good at that that, ironically, it... It didn't exactly hurt her career, but it kept her from becoming um, a star on the same level in terms of fame as somebody like Joan Crawford or Betty Davis. Um, uh, Because audiences a lot of times didn't realize 
they were seeing the same actress from film to film because right. she would look so different for, from movie to movie. Yeah. Uh, uh, were you ever on the set of any of your mom's movies? Yes. Uh, yeah, I sure was. Uh, <laughs> very memorably, when I was about nine years old in San Francisco, uh, I was there on the set of, or, or the, the shooting locations of uh, uh, a film she did called Eye of the Cat, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> which was written by um, uh, Joseph Stefano, uh, who famously also wrote the screenplay for uh, Psycho. Um, and she later did another film uh, for TV, a very good one called uh, Home for the Holidays, uh -huh. as well, with, with uh, Sally Field and uh, oh, yeah. Billy Harris, a lot of other terrific people. And uh, so, um, but uh, I Had the Cat, which was a suspense, a sort of Hitchcockian uh, suspense film, uh, had a sequence in it <clears throat> where my mother's character, uh, who was in a wheelchair in the film, not because she could not walk, which she could, and yeah. she was in the wheelchair because of uh, severe emphysema. And so there is a sequence in the film where, uh, being San Francisco, it was very uh, hilly, and she lived in a mansion uh, on uh, the crest of a hill, and um, she sees something out of her window, and she wants to... Uh, Actually, no. It's, it's, it's her, her, one of her two sons in the film is actually taking her out for a walk, and and he sees something uh, across in the window of the house. So he leaves her there at the top of the hill for a moment, and goes in to investigate, see what's going on, and um, uh, and he that character played by Michael Sarazen has allurophobia which is fear of cats. And my mother's character uh, at the beginning of the film has about a hundred cats and she gets rid of them when her son, or, or I think it's her nephew, actually, her nephew, is, is good, played by Michael Sarazen, is going to come home and live with her. So she gets rid of all these cats. Well, they wind up coming back later in the film. But in this scene, um, uh, her wheelchair, her electric wheelchair malfunctions. Yeah. Uh, and she starts to slide down the hill. She manages to stop it for a moment, and uh, Michael Sarazen, her nephew, comes running out again to help her, And but bingo, one of the cats shows up. <laughs> and it's standing in between my mother and him, and he goes into a catatonic, <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> <a> catatonic uh, <laughs> state, and can't reach her. He's, he's frozen. And uh, and when he eventually snaps out of it and tries to, to grab her, the cat leaps at him into his arms and he, he, he like just can't deal with that at all. He, he kind of crumples and, uh, and then there's this really frightening scene, uh, in terms of the incredible stunt work, uh, involved where her wheelchair does go backwards down the, the steep hill. Yeah. And, and I was there while they shot that. And, uh, uh, the cats of the film were trained by Ray Berwick, famous animal trainer who trained, uh, all of the birds for Hitchcock's Psycho. And, uh, and, um, my mom, she did some of the stuff at the beginning of the stunt, but then, uh, when it really got going and became a thing where the wheelchair is out of control and is going backwards down this hill, they got an incredible stunt woman, uh, to do this for real. Uh, and the thing was, my mother had a rule where she did not want family members to actually be there while she was filming. Wow. If it was some scene that she wasn't in, if it was some earlier thing, and, you know, she felt, you know, that was okay, but if she was going to be needed or whatever to do various parts of a scene, even though a big chunk of it was the, this amazing stunt, she didn't want me there. <laughs> so, <laughs> combining <laughs> my makeup uh, penchant, uh, with my determination to be there to see this thing, I disguised myself. Okay, now I'm nine years old, remember. I disguised myself as a grown man, wearing a mustache and, 
and a hat and a trench coat yeah. and you know god knows what i must have looked like and i uh went from the hotel where we were staying to this park across the street from where they were shooting where i would get a good view and i'm like hiding in the trees watching this whole stuff and and at a certain point in this process uh i saw my mother uh who you know call her chauffeur over uh and whisper in his ear about something and the chauffeur then turned and went to the car got in and took off and i thought oh my god she sent him to get me at the hotel and i'm not going to be there because i'm here hiding in the trees watching her so like a mad person i uh took off running and huffing and puffing up up the hills of san francisco to, to get to our hotel which was pretty close to the location but uh now that really must have been a sight this uh, nine-year-old kid disguised as an adult <laughs> running through the streets of san francisco <laughs> to get back to our hotel but uh i'm, I'm glad i did it because uh, i got to see one of the great stunts of its time it was uh, yeah. quite a spectacular sequence so yeah so yes the answer is yes i i uh did get to be on the set of one of my mom's films I, I love, you know, the the man with the golden arm and Sound of Music, uh, An American Dream with Stuart Whitman, uh, Home from the Hill, Detective Story. She did some great films. He sure did. Her, her uh, Detective Story was one of her three <clears throat> Oscar-nominated roles for Best Actress. Uh, uh, the first one was Caged. Uh, when they've sort of, it's been called the the uh, Citizen Kane of women's prison films. Yeah. And uh, and she for which she got the Oscar nomination for best actress and uh, won the Venice Film Festival award for best actress of the world uh, for that role. So that that's pretty cool. And then yeah. in Detective Story and her third Oscar nominated role was uh, um, um, a very. Uh, impressive uh, performance in a, in a film in which she played uh, Marjorie Lawrence, an opera singer. It's a true story about an opera singer who got polio at the height of her career uh, and then uh, was paralyzed from the waist down, but wound up making a, an impressive comeback uh, where the opera was restaged for her to actually uh, be able to use leg braces and the wheelchair. Uh, and um, and that was a hell of a, uh, a role in which he also got to do all these big arias, uh, famous operatic arias. And even though she was not an opera singer, she actually learned all of those arias and sung them full out mm-hmm. on the uh, soundstage uh, and wore, um, um, you know, ear little... Um, Oh, what do you call? You put them in your ears. Did not ear muffs. <laughs> Those would have been quite visible. Uh, little little foam ear stoppers, you know, to uh, yeah. uh, block out the noise, uh, so they could play it full volume on the set, loud enough so that she could sing full out with the proper breathing technique and not uh, appear to be lip syncing it. Because when a person lip syncs, you can tell, I mean, especially if they're doing these big arias where the breathing is very important, you need to be able to see that she's really singing, not just moving her lips. And uh, so, yeah, she sang that role full out and then it was uh, dubbed in the final film by a very famous opera singer uh, of that time named uh, Eileen Farrell. So uh, that was her favorite film, actually, of all of her movies was uh, uh, Interrupted Melody. And then um, I, I, called, I later called it Interrupted Malady. Uh, but, um, <laughs> she, uh, however, her most famous film uh, unquestionably is uh, The Sound of Music, which obviously is one of the most you know beloved films of all time. Uh, won Best Picture that year. And... Um, um, while I did not uh, get to be on location in in Salzburg, Austria, mm-hmm. uh, for the shooting of that, uh, she did bring home uh, quite a spectacular gift for me. Uh, she brought home a a set of beautiful handmade uh, puppets yeah. and a puppet theater, much like the the puppet theater in the film itself, only not quite that large but yeah. <laughs> it was a beautifully handmade you know thing and uh i at the time was about seven years old and um within within several days uh i had the puppets out of the backyard 
uh, half of them buried up to the waist in mud and strung up on strings to various little bamboo poles and so forth. And, and she came out and saw this and was horrified and said, oh, my God, what are you doing? And it's said, those beautiful puppets. And I said to her, they've been bad, Mommy. I'm torturing them. Yeah. <laughs> that that was me as a kid. I, I definitely uh, was uh, kind of like a cross between uh, Harold and Harold and Maud mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, uh, Pugsley Adams. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome. So, did you go to uh, school with any like movie star kids? I did. It's a funny you would ask that. Yes, I sure did. Um, I went to school with the uh, two of the sons of John Aston. Uh, the, of course, famously Gomez uh, at yeah. that time on the Adams family, and uh, Morgan, uh, the son of Yvonne de Carlo, the mother of the Munsters. Wow. Like, <laughs> and, and so, yes, I <laughs> went to school with, uh, with the children of both of the TV's most famous uh, creepy families. Oh, and creepy. Um, creepy and kooky. Mysterious and ooky. <laughs> and, um, uh, there's a great story uh, about uh, Vivanda Carlo. Uh -huh. uh, she came to um, the house where I was living at the time on Beverly Glen mm -hmm. um, to pick me up. Uh, to her son was with her uh, to pick me up and go back to their house for a, a, a play date with her son. So uh, he and I went to actually a military academy together. Uh, in, in This was second grade, and it was called Black Fox Military Academy. And, you know, at that age, to me, it was like, you know, playing dress up, you know, getting to wear a uniform. And, you know, I had a great time and I got a medal and a ribbon and, you know, all of that. It was, uh, it was pretty cool, I thought. And, um, so, uh, but what was even cooler to me was <laughs> being picked up by the mother in the Munsters driving her amazing customized car, which was done by the famous our customizer that also created the Munster coach. Uh, mm. Barris was the, was it, what was the, this person, something, Chuck Barris? Was it that, or, or was that the guy from Chuck the Barris is the gong show, yeah. I get the mix, no, but uh, Barris was, was the, his last name, I remember, and uh, famous cu customizer also did the Batmobile. And, you know, he created all those kind of amazing. Well, uh, William, Doz William Dozer that. was uh, the creator of Batman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the move, the show itself. I'm talking about the guy who created the cars, the customized oh, cars. Oh, I, I couldn't tell you that. <laughs> yeah, he, he did the Batmobile. He did the Monster Coach, and so well, he created an amazing car personally uh, for uh, as a, a gift from the studio for Yvonne De Carlo, and it was a black Mercedes Benz with uh, cobweb decals on the hubcaps. Mm -hmm. It had funeral handlebar like you'd see on the side of a fancy coffin or on the sides of the car, yeah. um, and uh, various other accoutrements. And, um, and on the front of the car, uh, where there would normally be the uh, insignia for uh, you know the, the little thing at the front uh, for the, this uh, Mercedes, the Mercedes symbol, uh, would have been replaced by a silver wolf's head that had these uh, red ruby eyes. Uh, I don't know if they were real rubies, but they looked like it. And whenever she would turn on the engine, uh, the eyes of the wolf would light up glowing red. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a hell of a thing. And um, so she picks me up in this amazing car. Her son gets in the back seat so I can sit in the front seat next to her. Mm -hmm. I got the royal treatment. And it, just as if it had been scripted uh, by the writers of the Munsters, as we're like halfway to their house driving, uh, it began to rain. Mm -hmm. And at that point, uh, Yvonne DiCarlo pushed this button and, and opened up the sunroof and rain is coming now into the car and she holds up her hand feeling the rain and she smiles and says ah oh, what lovely weather yeah <laughs> <laughs> so the things you could get away with back like, then you can't get away I, with it now <laughs> you can't what i couldn't hear you 
I said, you can't get away with that stuff today. <laughs> no, no, but, <laughs> but um, anyway, yeah, that was, uh, I thought that was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so yeah. She played the character for me literally and, you know, did what Lily would have done. It was, uh, yeah, I never forgot that. So she endeared herself to me forever with that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you made your TV debut in the movie of the week, If I Love You, Am I Trapped Forever? Uh, actually, it wasn't a, 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 a movie uh, for TV. It was a pilot okay. uh, for a series that never sold. Okay. So we shot, I shot the pilot. It was done at 20th Century Fox Studios. I was about 13 or 14 years old. Um, I played it was an ensemble show. I was one of the characters who was set uh, in and around uh, school. And um, uh, my girlfriend in the film was, uh, in the film, the TV uh, pilot, uh, was uh, Denise Nickerson. Uh, uh, Violet who, in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. She was almost going to be on here at one point, uh, yeah. but she became a vegetable, sadly. I, I'm so <laughs> sad about I, Violet, that. Violet Beauregard, yes, is, is transformed into a giant blueberry. Yeah. And uh, she was also famously in uh, Dark Shadows. Dark Shadows, uh, yep. A soap opera, and uh, yeah, she was a sweetheart. Anyway, and she she played my uh, girlfriend in this uh, pilot, and the pilot was done by all the same group of people that did Mash. It was directed by Gene Reynolds. It was written by Larry Gelbart. Mm -hmm. Both of them famously uh, from you know Mash. Later did Mash. Yeah, and uh, and so or maybe they did it. Maybe they were already working on Mash, and this was a another like a spinoff thing. Not a spinoff. It had nothing to do with Mash, but yeah. for them, for them, it was you know. A, he had a contract at Fox, and he needed another show to fulfill. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, yeah that was that was fun. The, the the mother in it was played by uh, Eleanor Donahue, the, oh, yeah. uh, the big sister from uh, Father Knows Best, and uh, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was it was fun. It didn't sell, but you know, nevertheless. That was my first uh, actual paid film acting job, or I mean, I mean, on film. It was for television, but you know, as opposed to on stage, I'd done stage things before that. I, uh, mm -hmm. um, in fact, I later wound up working with my mother in a play. Uh, this was when I was a little bit older. At that, that point, I think uh, how old was I? I don't know, about. It was around the same time as If I Loved You, I Might Trap Forever, uh, and it was called Finishing Touches. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this in this play, uh, my brother was also in it, playing my brother. Uh -huh. uh, my sister as well, uh, one of my sisters, Sharon, was in the play as well. Uh, not playing my sister, but playing someone who's you know a friend of the family and uh, anyway um uh my stepfather was in the play also playing my dad and uh, and my mom played my mom so <laughs> type casting there and uh yeah. you know but my mother was the the the, the main lead in it uh, and so was my stepdad one of the, the two main leads and um uh, we did that in, at a dinner theater in uh, St. Charles, Illinois, so not too far from Chicago. And, uh, you know, it was, um, I think it lasted for about, you know, like all of those productions scheduled in advance with dinner theaters. Uh, it ran about a month. And um, uh, that was a, a very unusual experience working yeah. with my mom. Because, you know, what we talked about earlier, my mother did not want to have family members there while she was working. Right. Well, in this place, she was practically working <laughs> with nobody but her family members, except for one or two other supporting roles played by other actors. But um, the thing is, uh, I quickly discovered that when she was working, uh, she sure as heck wasn't my mom anymore in terms of the way she would behave. It was all business, all work, no family stuff. It was, you know, she was focused totally on uh, the role and on the play. And, uh, and so we kind of followed suit. And, uh, you know, the minute we went to the theater together and stepped into the theater and dressing rooms, we were uh, also uh, no longer, you know, family, but, uh, but co-workers with her, and uh, she maintained that separation. I mean, she wasn't delusional. She didn't, you know, stop acting like we were who we were, but it was, it was, it was all focused on, you know, the task at hand. Uh, so, 
you know, it was really neat to work with her, but it was not at all like I thought it would be. She was nothing like, you know, mom at home. Yeah. Then you work with the legendary Tony Richardson in a death in Canaan. Anything stand out about that? Oh, yes. Uh, many, many things. So that was uh, uh, shot in uh, Eureka, California, uh, in uh, a town called Ferndale, which uh, is a sort of... Uh, it, it, it really looks like it, it is in New England rather than California, uh, so much so that it was also used as the uh, the town of Salem's Lot uh, by Toby Hooper yeah. and uh, James Mason, etc. In the you know beautifully done, very scary uh, TV movie, which is still the best yeah, version. Yeah, I, I think it will. Re I think it will remain the best version, no matter what I other agree. versions they're going to do in the in yeah. the film, in the movie theater. It's certainly the TV remake they did was. Uh, you know, not as uh, powerfully effective as uh, Salem's Lot was for in the original version. Uh, but anyway, same town, and uh, in the Death in Canaan, it's the, the same church, the same cemetery in the story where my mother is buried. Uh, in, in, there I am, so, you know, famously, that's the cemetery from Salem's Lot where the kid comes back to life at the bottom of the grave and attacks the grave digger. Uh, and um, so... Uh, yeah, working with Tony Richardson, that was an amazing experience. Uh, uh, I mean, he was already a, a legend of me. I'd already seen a number of his films, and of course he directed the Oscar-winning uh, movie starring uh, uh, Albert Finney, uh, Tom Jones, and many other films. Uh, Look Back in Anger with Richard Burton, The Entertainer with Laurence Olivier, which he also directed him on stage in. And... Uh, uh, the movie The Loved One with Rod Steiger as Mr. Joy Boy, and that's oh, yeah. great, great, great stuff. And uh, yeah, I loved working with Richardson. I learned so much from him. Uh, one of the first lessons I learned as an actor was from him, very important in terms of film acting, namely that he said to me, for, for close-ups, he said, if you, if you like raise your eyebrow, mm -hmm. you know, just this much, uh, you know, it may feel to you like you're not doing that much, but on screen in a big close-up, uh, and if it were shown in a theater, you, your eyebrow would jump like two feet. You know, it would be this very noticeable thing. So you've got to, you've got to let the camera look inside you. He said, if if you are being truthful, you're being real. The camera will pick that up. It'll go right inside you, right into your eyes, and down into you, and it will see what is going on inside you. You yeah. don't have to do a lot facially; just be real, but don't don't overemphasize things. Uh, and um, and that stood me in very good stead because, of course, he was absolutely right. <clears throat> and luckily, he told me that right at the beginning, at the get-go. And uh, and you know, I've benefited from that advice ever since. Uh, he wonderfully um, rehearsed everything like a play. Uh, a couple weeks before we went to the location uh, to film there, and other stuff was also filmed on location. The interiors were built on uh, a, uh, a soundstage there locally. We didn't actually film anything at uh, Warner Brothers, even though it was a Warner Brothers uh, made-for-television film. Um, he, he would rehearse us at first at his home, uh, and uh, we would we would rehearse it and rehearse it, um, running the lines together uh, as if we were doing a play. Uh, and then the various actors we would when we were in uh, Ferndale and Eureka uh, filming there, we would get together after we were shooting, and you know uh, into the night instead of you know, doing things around the town, we would be working uh, in our hotel rooms together, uh, rehearsing the next day's scenes. Uh, and a lot of the, the film involved uh, my character, whose name, it's a, it's a real life uh, st true story, um, in which a boy named Peter Riley, my character, uh, was falsely accused of the murder of his mother. And then he was brainwashed by the police into believing that he had committed the murder, but could not remember having done it because it was so upsetting that I had like wiped it out of my memory, which was 
not true and was proved later that in fact I could not have committed the murder uh, through evidence that had been suppressed in one of the two trials uh, in the second half of the film. The second trial had information that had been uh, kept out of the first trial and it, 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 um, it wound up uh, absolving me of the crime and um, uh, so it was, it was a remarkable story, the first half of which I was uh, being given these extensive uh, lie detector tests. Uh, the lie detector um, operator, who was also a policeman in the film, uh, was played by the late, great uh, Kenneth McMillan, uh -huh. who will be well known uh, to people as Baron Harkonnen in the first film version of Dune, directed by David Lynch. Uh, he was also the... Uh, the, the town sheriff in Salem's Lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's interesting because in Salem's Lot, uh, James Mason played the main villain, uh, Mr. Uh, Straker, uh, and, well, the other main villain, of course, is the famous Mr. Barlow, played by the late, great Reggie Nolder, who I also knew. But, but I knew James Mason very well because he had just played my dad uh, in the film um, uh, The Passage, uh, which also had Malcolm McDowell, and uh, and uh, Christopher Lee, uh, Anthony Quinn, um, Patricia Neal played my mom. It was a hell of a cast, and uh, that was filmed in France. Uh, mm -hmm. I was there for three months in the Pyrenees Mountains uh, mm -hmm. and in uh, uh, Nice and Monte Carlo, that area, uh, filming uh, at the Victorine Studios uh, doing uh, The Passage. So, oh, yeah. Uh, and that was right after, that was my next film, after Death in Canaan. But my Death in Canaan was really my debut, and um, uh, it wound up getting a number of Emmy nominations, and uh, it was a, a, we got wonderful reviews and great ratings. It was huh. CBS uh, television movie, but it was, uh, uh, it was played in a special um, thing where it didn't have... Uh, commercial breaks with commercial breaks it would have been an, uh, two and a half hours long uh, but it ran in a special thing where with um, minimal <clears throat> minimal breaks and uh, so it was in a I think it was a two hour time slot uh, and uh, later it would it, with commercials it would have been two and a half hours long uh, so it, sadly when it was rerun uh, they wound up cutting about 20 or 25 minutes out of it because of having to stick commercials into the thing and have it still be in a two hour time slot yeah. so it was never as effective when they uh, replayed yeah. it uh, unfortunately but in its original version it was uh, very powerful and we used the real transcripts uh, because those those um, those lie detector sessions, as uh, and the trial, of course, were all um, recorded, uh, and uh, we had the transcripts of everything that was actually said. And I, and in the case of the lie detector stuff, I was able to actually listen to the uh, audio tapes of this uh, poor kid getting uh, uh, interrogated uh, for hours on end, and. Um, uh, so listening to the real tapes, I could get a feeling for what, you know, Peter Riley had gone through. Um, and by the way, he and I have uh, stayed in touch, uh, mm -hmm. got back in touch again in, in recent uh, years uh, or months. Uh, he's a great guy, and uh, we're, uh, we, you know, lately been uh, talking again. We've had some wonderful conversations. I met him after I played him. I saw a lot of video footage of him, interviews and so forth, to kind of study, see what he was like. Uh, and um, while I wasn't trying to do an imitation of him, and uh, uh, I nevertheless wanted to get a feeling for what kind of person he was. And, um, uh, and then later, after I played the role, uh, and it had its premiere uh, at the, the Lincoln Center uh, Theater in New York. Uh, they had a special screening there for the press and so forth. I, uh, they flew me out there uh, to, to do the, the, the um, oh, you know, the, the press event at the, uh, um, where you do a, um, uh, well, it was anything where, well, you know, a number of the actors were there, and we were all mm -hmm. doing interviews at a press conference, uh, and uh, and then and then the premiere, and uh, um, so that that was very.
very cool. That was my first time as uh, as an adult in New York uh, professionally. I'd been there as a kid uh, with my parents, but um, so anyway, that was uh, that was very cool, and uh, and that's where Peter Riley uh, and I actually met for the first time. Mm-hmm. And uh, and after the screening, he came up to me and told me that um, uh, when he was watching me. He said, when, I, when he said to me, when I was watching you, I felt as though I were watching myself. You were really right about me. And that was the highest compliment I could get. So <laughs> pretty cool. Yeah. So tell me about the passage, because I'll tell you, I've interviewed Anthony Quinn's widow. I've interviewed James Mason's grandson and, um, you know, a big fan of both those guys. And I, everyone tells me Jay Lee Thompson was like the nicest director and he was very mentor like. Did you find that to be so? Um, y- yes, yes and no. Um, I love Jay Lee. He was a he was a dear man. Uh, and uh I would get together with he and his wife Penny on days off. We would go into like Monte Carlo together to the casino there, not to gamble, just to look at stuff and right. eat at the restaurant there. And and uh, we went to flea markets together and and uh, so forth. So yeah, I, I loved him. He was a dear man. Uh, he was the an inspiration for the character of the film director that Jack McGowan played in uh, The Exorcist. <clears throat> and um, uh, William Peter Blatty had done a film earlier with Jay Lee Thompson uh, and he he was such a character that um, Blatty never forgot him in terms of his just quirky quirkiness, his eccentricities, his mannerisms. He had a habit of tearing strips of paper off of his uh, the, the scripts uh, while he was working and he would chew on the little pieces of paper like uh, a kind of a, you know, um, as if he was trying to stop smoking, you yeah. know, and this was his substitute was to chew on the paper, and uh, and uh, and he twirl them in his fingers and make little shapes out of them. And, uh, but yeah, he I, he certainly did that when I worked with him, and and uh, that was written into the novel of The Exorcist. I don't think Jack McGowan in the movie does the thing with the tearing the strips off the uh, scripts, but uh-huh. but it, but it is mentioned, I think, in the in the novel, and. Um, uh, um, so anyway, uh, yeah, that was uh, an amazing experience working for three months with, with all of those people. Basically, it was, it was like making a, a Bond film in one way because, I mean, it was an action adventure thing with its, the, the whole stunt crew was the same stunt crew that did the Bond films. And now when I see a lot of those early Connery Bonds, you know, I I know who's doing what. And like on Her Majesty's Secret Service, I know, oh, oh that's Dickie Graydon doing that stunt on with the cable car where he's sliding along hand by hand, dangling from the cables. Uh, I know that was him. Uh, he he in fact created a a stunt for me in that film that scared the hell out of my mom and made her furious when she saw the movie that I had actually gone along with that and done this and didn't insist on having the stunt man do the whole thing but I wanted to be in there doing whatever I could re- really you know get away with uh so um I actually did do a stunt where I was uh, hanging from a uh, bridge, the bottom of a suspension bridge, uh, going between the, across this gorge, and down below me were uh, sort of raging uh, white water. You know, it was a white water river uh, down below, and all the rocks. And I'm hanging you know, like 50 feet above this uh, river, dangling from uh, the cables of this uh, bridge. And it was really me doing it. He, he worked up a thing uh, attached to a harness under my coat where a thin cable went up one of my arms uh, and wrapped around the bottom of the bridge. And then I put my hand over it, and it looked like I was hanging. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was actually hanging from the cable, not hanging by my arm. But And being that it was just the one arm, at some point I was able to let go with one of my hands and there I am dangling by one arm uh, from this bridge over this rushing white water river and um, uh, <laughs> but it was really me uh, courtesy of uh, Dickie Graydon who uh, was a master with uh, 
uh, all kinds of stunts of that nature. In fact, he's the one that worked out the spectacular sequence at the climax of You Only Live Twice mm -hmm. inside uh, Blofeld's uh, volcano lair when all of those ninjas come sliding down those hundreds of, uh, of cables from the, right. the opening at the top. And, uh, yep, Richard Graydon, he, he worked that whole thing out. And then there was also, um, uh, oh, God, what's his last name? It was Powell, another one of the stunt, big famous stuntmen who did a lot of the Bond films. And just the, the, the whole crew, mm -hmm. the whole stunt crew had been, you know, uh, with the Bond films. And the passage was produced by uh, Maurice Binder. Uh, the man who famously did all of the uh, incredible uh, credit sequences from the Bond films, starting with uh, Thunder. Joe Ball. Powell, he's the stunt guy. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. Joe. Joe Powell. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and now, and I think his his son wound up taking over for him. It's kind of you know when you know uh, followed in his father's footsteps. And uh, but. Um, but yeah, uh, Maurice Binder was one of the producers of the passage, and most famously, I mean, he he uh, he created the uh, gun barrel sequence that begins every Bond film to this day, where you know he shoots into the camera and the blood runs down over the uh, that famous you know gun barrel. Uh, that was uh, mm -hmm. that was the invention of uh, Maurice Binder. So you know that was super cool. This the director of photography uh, on the film was uh, Michael Reed. Uh, who was the cinematographer on, on Her Majesty's Secret Service uh, with the, the one-time Bond, George Lazenby. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and then, of course, in the movie, I'm acting alongside two, not one, but two James Bond villains. Uh, Christopher Lee, of course, who was Scaramanga in The Man with the Golden Gun. And then Michael Lonsdale mm -hmm. uh, was uh, later uh, to play Drax in uh, Moonraker. Right. Uh, and interestingly, he played that role uh, because I, I, of my, you know, very strong influence on him at the time. He, being a, um, a, a an actor in a lot of like more kind of art films and things of that nature in theater, uh, he had never done other than, I guess, if you want to call it, it's a thriller of sorts, uh, mm. The Day of the Jackal. Uh, where he played as a police inspector searching for this master spy criminal played by Edward Fox, but uh, it, uh, but that wasn't that wasn't really that wasn't a Bond film, uh, and he was sort of wanting at that stage in his career to be in a a blockbuster. He wanted to be in a big action blockbuster, and they had just offered James Mason the role of Drax in Moonraker, and he passed on it in favor of um, uh, playing uh, Dr. Watson yes. to uh, Christopher Plummer, Sherlock Holmes in, uh, uh, what was that, A Blood Something? Of, well, you, you probably know the title, you know, you're the master of minutia. Uh, <laughs> yep. uh, no, not Crucifer of Blood. What was the name of that? Do you remember the name of that the movie about with Sherlock Holmes and uh, Watson. I, it's uh, funny. So, I was never a huge Sherlock Holmes fan, so I, I, if you, oh. the only Sherlock Holmes I can tell you is the one Barry Levinson made and the Robert Downey Jr. ones. I don't know the old Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, this was the one about Jack the Ripper. They did two different movies. One Basil was, Rathbone. I know that. Study, study and Terror. Uh, yeah. With John Neville as Sherlock Holmes, that was uh, the first time they pitted Holmes against Jack the Ripper, and then this was the second time they did a movie about Holmes and the Ripper uh, and um, uh, yeah with, uh, with uh, Christopher Plummer as, as uh, Holmes but anyway <clears throat> that's the movie that James Mason decided to do instead of Moonraker and, uh, and then they offered it to Michael Lonsdale and he had not read the screenplay yet but I had because Mason had given me the script to read after he turned it down and uh, being a Bond fan I was thrilled to be able to read uh, a Bond screenplay play before the movie had even been made, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, Michael Lonsdale, he had never really seen, he wasn't, he was aware of the Bond movies, but he hadn't really seen them, and uh, so I said to him, I said, Michael, look, if you, if you, if your ambition at this point is to be in a guaranteed blockbuster movie, uh, a big action thing, you can't do better than to be the villain in a Bond film, uh, I promise you. 
if you do that film, you'll find yourself in a huge hit. And he did it. And then later he came to Los Angeles for the premiere. He invited me as his guest uh, to go to the premiere with him and then the big dinner afterwards with all the stars there. And uh, that was a hell of a time. I also became his guide uh, to Disneyland. Mm -hmm. uh, he and two of the, the lead females from the, the film, the... the, 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 the uh, um, Bond girls, I should say, not the main one, uh, Lois Childs, but uh, the two of the others, Blanche Revelek and, um, uh, oh God, I'm going to blow this now. Um, <laughs> uh, being a little older now, I have these uh, sort of little little moments where uh, yeah. my mind isn't as quick as it always was. I used to be able to bring every title and every name to mind instantly, but... Um, uh, she was the star of a, a, a French film called The Story of O. The Story of O. The Story yeah. of O, yeah. Um, I couldn't tell you. And, uh, and she plays a sort of sacrificial lamb in Moonraker who gets... Uh, Lois uh, Childs? No, no, Lois Childs, yeah. She was the main... That was, she was the main Bond girl, but there were these other two. Uh, Blanche Revelek, who became uh -huh. the girlfriend of Jaws, played by... Uh, Richard Keel, and then the other one uh, is the one I'm talking about, who I also uh, went to Disneyland with. It was so she was dark haired, and she gets uh, killed by wolves. That they're dogs. It was set upon by Corinne uh, Cleary. There we go, Corinne Cleary. Yes, uh -huh. Corinne Cleary. Thank you for saving my bacon there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so um, I got to spend the day with uh, two of two of the Bond girls from the film, and. Uh, the villain uh, of the film, uh, Drax himself, uh, Michael Lonsdale, and uh, that was a truly surreal experience because at one point, the movie having just come out, you know, a lot of people were noticing us, especially they would notice uh, Michael Lonsdale being that he's the main villain, a lot of he got recognized wherever we went, and, uh, but the weirdest moment, the really surreal moment is when uh, Michael was recognized by the seven dwarfs. Uh, at uh, Sleeping Beauty Castle there, uh, and they surrounded him, uh, asking for his autograph. And here he is signing autographs for the Seven Dwarfs. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it doesn't get much more surreal than that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So was the, the Beast Within a standard audition for you? Um, yes, actually it was. Uh, it was, um, uh, it was, yeah, um, after the... I had done a, uh, uh, just before I did The Beast Within, the role I did just before that was an episode of Quincy uh, called Seldom Silent, Never Heard, uh, in which I played a young man with Tourette's Syndrome. And that was a very powerful piece. It won an award that year from the governor of California as the best dramatic program of the year. Uh, it was an episode of Quincy. And uh, I, um, uh, so many people saw that uh, and uh, that I got, I got quite a few roles just on the strength of that episode of Quincy. I don't know why so many people wound up seeing it, but they did. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, I must have gotten three or four other roles just on the strength of having done that Quincy. And then it was. It was also far enough back in time that uh, uh, a lot of casting people and directors uh, also remembered uh, um, Death in Canaan. Mm -hmm. uh, I had strong, strong memories of that as well. So that, that one-two punch of a death in Canaan and uh, the Quincy uh, made it possible for me to uh, get a certain number of uh, offers where I didn't even have to audition. Uh, but generally, like most actors, I would audition, and The Beast Within was one such audition. And uh, nobody had seen the Quincy at that time because uh, I had just finished making it, but it hadn't aired yet. So... Um, yeah, it was a it was a standard audition, uh, and um, I was thrilled to get the part because you know having grown up as a what they call a, a monster kid back mm -hmm. in the days of uh, uh, Forey Ackerman and Famous Monsters, uh, which by the way I wrote articles for and did artwork for as well, um, uh, and had a, an issue of uh, Famous Monsters dedicated to me, so. Uh, to be able to uh, star in my very own horror film and even get to play the monster, no less, uh, was uh, a, a nightmare come true. 
Yeah, I mean, I've talked to Philip, I've talked to um, uh, Catherine, and, you know, I, I, I like this movie. I think it's very underrated. I think it should have been bigger than it was, you know. I mean, what I are your with, thoughts on it? it? Why do you think it didn't do as well as, as it should have? Um, uh, basically, the, um, there was some sort of uh, um, uh, sexual tension in the movie, you know, United Artists MGM at the time. I think I don't even know if it was if it had joined together yet with uh, MGM, but I know it was the the logo at the beginning of the movie uh, is United Artists, uh, not mm -hmm. not MGM. Uh, now you know in the later releases it was oh, yeah. MGM uh, on on DVD and so forth. It was MGM, but uh, <clears throat> but um, it, because of that, they uh, it, whenever you get caught in the midst of that's happened a couple times in my career where uh, you your your film is part of the you know, regime change at the studio, the people who had originally produced and developed it uh, don't put as much into it. The, that happened to uh, Barbara Hershey's film, The Entity. Uh, yeah. She should have gotten an Oscar nomination for that. Uh, oh, yeah. Powerful, powerful performance and a very scary film, but it had a, a short shelf life in the movie theaters because of that regime change at Fox. And uh, when new people came in, they said, oh, well, that wasn't my movie. I didn't develop that. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to, you know, go out of my way to publicize that film. Uh, I have my own projects to, to concentrate on. So they give it, you know, short shrift. So uh, that was only in the theater um, for like a week. And the same was uh, true of uh, The Beast Within. Uh, however, it had quite a life later on uh, on home video and, uh, and on cable uh, and became a cult uh, favorite. Yeah. How long uh, was the makeup process? Well, now that's a whole story in itself uh, with uh, the Berman Studios and the, the great Tom Berman. He, um, oh, yeah, uh, I've met Tom. He, uh, yep, uh, great guy. Anyway, he, he very talented. He um, <clears throat> first, his, he and his crew, his team, had to do a full body cast of me um, from head to toe. They did my head first, head and shoulders, and then uh, from neck down, the whole body, uh, body cast, and uh, because being that I was going to actually play the final beast as well as the uh, poor tortured Michael uh, McClary, um, I had to have all these different stages of makeup done for me, and uh, about five or six different uh, stages just for the transformation scene alone, and then more subtle makeup earlier in the film. Um, uh, and... Um, uh, but in order to make the, the final uh, creature suit, they had to build it on a cast of me so it would fit perfectly. And, uh, and uh, it was made of this material that eventually, with time, uh, liquefies. It turns into goo uh, because one of the constituents <laughs> in the mixture was actually some type of like gasoline. And uh, but put together with these other chemicals, it created a very uh, real uh, flesh-like substance that had total flexibility. So even though it was a cumbersome suit in terms of its size and bulk and so on, it, it moved very uh, easily uh, because it, it, it had such, you know, softness and fluidity. It was very flexible. And, uh, and it was nice and warm, which was great because I had to shoot at night out in the woods of Mississippi at a time where it would get pretty damn cold. You could see our breath. And, uh, and, um, uh, having to do some of those scenes, I was, uh, uh, very pleased that it had a, a nice natural insulation to it so I didn't freeze when I was wearing that costume, even though it was at night in the woods. The poor girl who played uh, Kitty Ruth Moffat's uh, stunt double, my uh, Kitty Ruth was my girlfriend in the film, and her character, unfortunately, is uh, attacked and uh, sexually assaulted by this creature, yeah. uh, the, the beast, after the transformation scene. It had come, emerged from my body like a insect from a cocoon or like a cicada. Uh, the whole thing was based on the life cycle of the cicada, which is a 17-year life cycle. They, they, they hibernate in the ground for all that time, and then at the end of the 17 years, they emerge from the ground as in their new uh, insect form with wings. And, uh, and uh, so I became the first uh, 
were cicada instead of werewolf. I was a were cicada, the first one and, and, and the only one still in the history of movies, the, the one and only were cicada. So anyway, um, uh, doing that scene with the poor the poor girl who was the stunt double, I mean, she had to, you know, my me in the beast costume that's the weirdest scene i've ever had to shoot mm-hmm. where i had to tear her clothes off and uh and it was so cold that you know you could see this like steam rising from her body and uh and here's philippe mora directing me in this sequence as i am you know i've got this huge head on with mechanics that control the mouth and so forth and and i couldn't see because of these large eyes that looked like bigger versions of my own eyes blue eyes uh i had to i could only see through the nostrils of the 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 the, the mask the, the, the head so i had very you know small you know, field of vision to do what I needed to do. So here I am sort of half blindly, uh, you know, with these clawed hands, you know, tearing the clothes off this poor girl and then simulating her rape. And, uh, you know, that girl deserved a medal. I mean, it was freezing. She's naked and it's cold. And uh, But uh, one of the crew members uh, was uh, so impressed by her uh, her work in that scene that uh, he wound up becoming her husband. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean at that time you know there was a huge advancement in technology being made with special effects and i think you guys were filming like around the same time as an american werewolf in london and i think the howling was about to come out yep, absolutely the howling yeah. uh, sort of set the template the howling came first uh and then um american werewolf in london american werewolf in london was done around the same time i don't know if it was just before or during or just after but but uh, the transformation scene in the Beast Within was done around that same time, and but it, you know but the uh, you know following the lead of uh, the transformation in the Howling, um, it was taken even further in the Beast Within in terms of the insane things that happened to my body during that uh, sequence. This at one point my this insectile tongue emerges from my mouth and twists and goes back inside, and and then my head starts to pulsate and then swell and it gets bigger and bigger and finally there's this sound like something tearing and cut to a close-up of bb dash the uh you know uh was the sweet absolute sweetheart the the late lamented bb um yeah. she passed away of cancer at a young <laughs> age and I, we became good friends. She was that really hit me hard. She was uh, an absolute uh, darling. Yeah, to work with a talented actress. Just wonderful. I love how I love how the movie begins. She's like grinding hamburger meat with her feet. <laughs> No, 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 no! You're mixing two things up, two, two scenes together. The, the feet going into the hamburger meat—that wasn't her. She oh. got attacked in the woods. Although that was filmed in a kind of dark way, so you don't see too much. The scene with the hamburger meat was Logan Ramsay. Oh, okay, okay. I got the two mixed up. Yeah, the Catherine the guy the mixed up too. Of yeah, his throat out. Okay. Uh, I'm biting him in the neck, and blood spray spraying everywhere. And there was that close up of his his feet going into the hamburger meat that he had been cooking right. at the beginning of the scene, with blood spraying on the hamburger meat. That was, uh, <clears throat> by the way, that was one of the hardest scenes I ever had to uh, film because Logan Ramsay was a brilliant um, improvisational uh, actor, uh, and very very funny. Uh, he would come up with these uh, amazing uh, lines yeah. here and there that weren't actually. In the original uh, screenplay by Tom Holland. He's a funny guy. Uh, he, he, he added these, you know, two or three lines that were in character and very memorable. Uh, and but we were not prepared for that. And when he said these two or three things, they were so funny that, you know, Philippe behind the camera was jamming a handkerchief into his mouth mm-hmm. and had tears of laughter rolling down his cheeks because he was so damn funny. But I was on camera with him, so I couldn't laugh, that's for sure. In fact, anything but that, I was getting ready to, you know, kill him. So <laughs> I'm very brooding and intense indeed, and that's one of the hardest pieces of acting I ever had to do yeah. was to be in that particular space and not laugh while even the director is jamming a handkerchief in his mouth to stop his laughter. It was so funny. Yeah, oh, you had all yeah. these great character actors in there. You had Urs Borgnine, L.Q. Jones, who just passed away, R.G. Armstrong, you know, and of course, Ronnie Cox and Misha yeah, Taylor. Abs- absolutely. 
all yeah. about Curtis Borgnine was that you said, boy, I think you're mixing it up with somebody else. Because Borgnine was not in the, that film. Um, it was uh, Don Gordon. Don Gordon was in it. L- L- LQ Jones uh, was the sheriff. Um, uh, of course, Ronnie Cox was my dad in the film. Uh, oh, you're Armstrong, right. Strong boy, uh, he was my doctor. You're right. I'm thinking uh, of uh, Deadly Blessing, which came out around the same time. I'm sorry about right. that. Oh, no, no problem. Yeah, of course. But anyway, uh, um, you know, Look, I'm, I'm mixing things up uh, myself here, <laughs> <laughs> which I've done a couple times. Yeah. You know, these things, you know, with, with, with the more time that goes by, you know, uh, you, you start to uh, mix up different movies together and say, wait a minute, no, that wasn't yeah. that movie where I worked. <laughs> it was that film. And it, so, uh, yeah. but anyway, um, yeah, I had a, a grand time uh, shooting that. It was a lot of fun. Uh, the God doing the transformation scene, that took three days yeah. to shoot uh, with all of the process aesthetics involved and uh now half the shots are actually me wearing the various prosthetics the other half of the shots were various uh, mechanical busts that they made um like uh, the stuff you see in the howling when the when the face starts growing into a wolf snout and again the the, the face starts elongating yeah. well you can't do that with an actual actor so that was a mechanical uh same thing in uh werewolf of america werewolf in london uh, and um, so there must have been God, six or seven changes of makeup for me the, during those three days uh, of each stage getting a little more extreme than the one before. Uh, by the way, they just came out with a uh, an action figure. Uh, of my character from the Beast Within uh, during the transformation. Uh, a company called Distinctive Dummies uh, just came out with a uh, $150 action figure. It, it was it's about the size of, I get the boxes like the size of a G.I. Joe. And yeah. uh, it, it, it's, it's very cool. Uh, you know you finally really made it when you become an action figure, by God. And <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> God, merch is, is huge now. Uh, my favorite scene is when the judge loses his head in the prison cell. That is oh, so yes. friggin' epic. I, it's better than, you know, the, the head blowing up in scanners. You know, it's way better oh, than that. Oh, thank you. Yes, when, when uh, uh, I wonder, were those my hands? They might have been, because Probably. those gloves, the, the, the hands were made for me. I, uh, it's like, I can't remember whether I did that or not, but I, but I wasn't uh, actually, obviously, pulling the head off of Don Gordon. It was a very good uh, fake head that gets pulled off of a dummy very realistically and it was hooked up so that blood would spray as the head was torn off and then the headless body drops to its knees and falls you know onto the floor uh when the hands come through the the walls of the jail cell you know nobody expected yeah. that and uh yeah that was that was uh, that was a cool moment the the yep. the most memorable moment though of the uh, for us or for me anyway uh of the um <clears throat> transformation scene was when, uh, and by the way, we were filming that in an actual hospital. It takes place in a hospital, but we really were filming in a real hospital uh, that was this huge um, facility in in Mississippi, in Jackson, where we were filming. Uh, It was the Whitfield State uh, Hospital for the Insane, or the yeah. Criminally Insane, or whatever. It's not, I don't know about Criminally Insane, at least not that part of the hospital wasn't for Criminally Insane patients, because these patients were able to, to walk around uh, freely, and uh, we were in a sort of disused wing of the hospital that wasn't being, you know, currently utilized, and, uh, but it really was, in fact, a hospital, and, um, and as we are filming, uh, the scene was actually in between uh, shooting uh, the, the transformation scenes. Uh, to pass the time, uh, myself and another person for the crew, we were uh, playing ball with um, uh, Don Gordon's decapitated head, uh, his bald head, fake head. We were throwing it back and forth uh, the, to each other, and God knows we what this patient thought when, when, when we turned and saw him standing in the doorway, gaping at the two of us playing ball with a decapitated head, <laughs> probably <laughs> set his therapy back uh, several years. Yeah. Do you still own that varsity jacket? I mean, what? What did you say? That varsity jacket you wore in the movie, do you oh. still own it? <laughs> oh, 
Oh God! Uh, oh, that's a sore point with me. Oh God! Okay, let's move uh, on. Let's no, no, move no, no, on. no, 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 not not in a personal way. I can certainly tell the story. I just it's kind of comically <laughs> uh, a sore point with me. Uh, what happened with that jacket was um, I wound up years later. Um, uh, I, I was dating a girl who was uh, a uh, a model. Uh, you can see her in the video, the rock video for Glenn Fry's song "Sexy Girl." Uh -huh. She was the sexy girl of the title uh, of that song, uh, and uh, uh, you know I had, she was my girlfriend at that time. And she, uh, I gave her, I lent her that coat for a a, a photo shoot she was doing, where uh, her character they thought it'd be good for her to have a varsity, you know, Letterman jacket. Mm -hmm. So uh, she borrowed mine. She wore it for the shoot. And instead of just bringing it back to me, which I wish she had done, she uh, had it taken, without mentioning it to me, she had it taken to a cleaner's, but not dry clean. She had it actually put through the whole deal. And and, uh, and the, the, the sleeves of that jacket, even though they looked like actual leather, they weren't. They weren't leather. They were some kind of leather-like vinyl. And they melted in in the process of cleaning this they were washing it uh and they became like stiff distorted plastic i don't know what you couldn't you couldn't you know it was useless at that point so uh but i cannot remember whether my memory is that i was so disgusted by the you know what happened to this thing that i angrily tossed it in the trash that i just threw it away i hope i in, in, that i you know that a, a saner moment prevailed after that and i uh, you know put it aside and saved it somewhere in a box or something i'm hoping eventually i will come across it and that i still have it uh because i could have the sleeves replaced of course and have new yeah. new new leather sleeves uh, put on but uh but at that point i couldn't wear it anymore because it was like wearing something made of you know hard plastic that wouldn't bend and uh it was ruined so uh in that sense, is a sore point in that, you know, I'm a collector myself, and I love keeping props and various things from my, you know, films that I've done, and, yeah. uh, and uh, I wanted to say that, but, you know, I couldn't, after that, I couldn't wear it, and, you know, and then I just said hell with it. But I don't remember whether I threw it away or not. I kept, you know, I, mm -hmm. I maybe someday I'll find it. I, I kept it after all, and I'll, I'll find it with some other stuff. I know I have the uh, the Levi jacket that I actually wear for most of the movie. Uh, there's quite a few of those scenes where I'm wearing the dark uh, denim jacket. That I do have, but I don't have the the Letterman. When people remember the Letterman jacket because it wound up in the uh, advertising, you'd see. Sh some pose shots of me, and on the uh, cover of, uh, there's a nice deep uh, cover, a uh, full-length thing of me at night at the moon, and and, uh, and there I am in that cover art, I am wearing the, uh, the Letterman jacket, yeah. I love They're Playing With Fire. I think it's such an underrated thriller. You know, I talked to Eric Brown last year about it. What was your yep. experience like? Uh... Uh, well, there you and I will have to part company. Uh, I thought it was uh, uh, kind of a, 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 well, not one of my uh, fondest uh, cinematic uh, achievements. Oh yeah, okay, we don't have to talk about it. I mean, I just... it's, it's pure exploitation. It's it's now people people have you know have said that about the Beast Within, but mm -hmm. the Beast Within compared to their playing with fire, I mean. Sorry, but that Beast of Moon's on a whole other level. Um, and I, I, what you said about uh, um, what you said about the play with fire, I think applies more strongly to the Beast Within in terms of it being underrated. In fact, uh, Rue Morgue magazine a little while, while back referred to the Beast Within as an underrated genre masterpiece. Right. And. Uh, I can't argue with that. I'm very, very fond of uh, the Beast Within. I, I think it's uh, it's gritty and has uh, uh, great black humor, some wonderful uh, uh, you know references to H.P. Lovecraft throughout, and with that incredible uh, cast of uh, you know basically it has um, um, uh, the entire stock company uh, of Sam Peckinpah uh, is in that film. I mean. It, you see enough Peck and Paw movies, you'll see almost all the supporting <laughs> actors from The Beast Within in there. And uh, so that was something where I was, you know, 
I felt, you know, proud of what I had done in that and the fact that I could play Michael's all the different stages of his his uh, torment, his confusion uh, as to, you know, not knowing what the hell's going on with him, but um, periodically being taken over by this, this evil uh, spirit, this evil, you know, entity. Uh, it, it got to be, a, it was a, a Jekyll and Hyde kind of role where I got to play both good and evil and, you know, uh, it was a lot for me to... Uh, uh, chew on, shall we say? Yeah. Um, uh, now, by comparison, the um, the uh, they're playing with fire, and uh, that's something that I, I have to admit I I did it uh, I, I did it just for the cash, right? You know. Um, now, having said that, I like the actors in it. There was the, pe- the people did a good job. The the, the actors in it, um, Eric Brown, uh, Sybil Danning. I wouldn't exactly have uh, normally thought of Sybil Danning as the uh, type casting for a college uh, teacher. You know, the, teaching Shakespeare. You know, that's not the first thing that would come to mind uh, <laughs> regarding a character played by Sybil Danning, but uh, nonetheless, she was uh, very nice to work with, an extremely smart lady. Wow, she speaks several languages fluently, yeah. uh, you know, very well read. Uh, you know, some people would have dismissed her as just some action babe who, you know, whatever, but no, no, she, she was... Uh, she was, uh, you know, pretty formidable uh, in terms of her intellect and um, uh, very professional, very nice to work with. And, uh, no, she was fine in the film. I mean, the actors were, 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 were all good. And yeah. uh, Andrew Prine, I oh, was, really best. loved his work and it was yeah. great to work with him. Uh, m- my gripe was uh, with the uh, direction of the film, which in a number of sequences... I guess whether it was a factor of the budget that they couldn't do a lot of coverage, that may have explained uh, some of this, but uh, we had like group sequences where, you know, four or five actors were standing or the same scene together. <clears throat> Instead of doing the like, you know, over the shoulder coverage from one actor onto another and right. so forth, which you would normally do in a group scene like that, the director would save time by just arranging us in a semicircle uh, so we could all be filmed at the same time. And, and But when you're in a group, you know, talking together with other people, you, you don't stand in a carefully arranged semicircle. It looks so phony and awkward. So, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that uh, I found, uh, you know, annoying. Also, uh, you know, I turn out, I'm the, you know, spoiler alert, Spoiler alert, I, I am the uh, killer in the movie. I turn out to be the, the murderer that they're looking for. And uh, they used this device where uh, they wanted to, they, they did a lot of close-ups of people's shoes mm. walking around uh, because um, several of the characters all wore the same shoes. So you see, it could be anybody. It could be that guy. They might have done it. She might have done it. Because they all wear the same shoes. So when you have these close-ups of the shoes walking, you don't know who it might be that, that you're, you know, whose footsteps you're, you're observing. Right. So I thought that was kind of hokey, you know. Now, my scenes in it, my, my normal scenes where you see me as myself, those were okay for me. That There was nothing embarrassing that I had to do or... Or anything that was fine. I play Eric Brown's uh, roommate, right. uh, and uh, oh, and he was he was really good to work with. As I said, all the actors nice were guy. good, and, mm-hmm. and it was fine to work with them. But uh, my character, oh, uh, at one point, I I uh, um, basically batter a girl to death. Well, there is a pun for you with a baseball bat. I uh, here I am dressed in a Santa Claus outfit, and I beat a girl to death with a with a baseball bat, which was uh, foam rubber, by the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, and if you look carefully in that scene, you can see that the, the bat indeed is rubber because you can see it kind of wiggle and bend, <laughs> which wasn't yeah. great. Uh, but fortunately, I'm wearing a plastic mask at that point, so you can't see that it's me. That's the kind of scene I would never normally do. I have turned down a couple horror film offers because um, it would have required me to do some truly uh, 
sadistic scenes like the horrible surgical stuff yeah. and so forth to some you know poor girl tied to a table and I, I just I'm not going to do that kind of thing I just I, I that's not that's not my thing I've seen movies that are truly uh, disturbing and horrific uh, most particularly the film uh, Martyrs which I actually thought was a, a, um, a masterpiece I thought you know that that was a work of art uh, but at the same time deeply disturbing and uh, I wouldn't have been you know keen on being one of the people who tortured the, the girls in that uh, right. as fine as the film is uh, you know I really don't want to be on camera doing something that vile right. and uh there was something I was offered where they were uh, playing some crazed uh, doctor or scientist who's like going to drill the eyeballs out of this poor girl while she's still awake. And, you know, it's like, and I said, and I, no, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm not, I can't do that. So I didn't. <laughs> and I don't really, I do not regret it. I never saw the movie, so I don't even know what it's called at this point. But. Um, uh, the other thing, uh, yeah, so that baseball bat scene, but at least, hey, I, you couldn't tell who it was, so that's okay. Uh, my face was not on a camera doing that. And, uh, secondly, uh, in, later in the film, uh, I had to be doing this, um, deranged voice. Uh, my character has Huntington's Korea, which, uh, causes your brain to kind of turn into mush over time. You become, uh, you know, insane with yeah. the progress of the illness. You, you basically lose your mental faculties. And, uh, and, um, and at that point, my character is wearing a ski mask uh, when I'm doing these, uh, this weird uh, baby voice. As it so happened, um, uh, I do a very good uh, baby imitation. I'm not going to do it for you here, so don't ask. But, <laughs> but you, can, you can rent the movie if you want to see me do this baby voice. But anyway, I did this uh, voice of a deranged baby saying that, you know, uh, do you want to come out and play with me or something? I'll tell one of my victims. But uh, again, fortunately, you cannot see my face. I'm wearing a ski mask, thank God. So and then when the mask comes off, at that point I'm dead, lying on the floor of an attic. So... It was okay. Uh, but, um, yeah, you know, I can see not being involved in it for somebody else to watch it. Uh, you know, they might enjoy it in a different way than I am able to because I was involved. And being involved, certain things were annoying to me. And, you know, the, the, it's different when you make a film uh, than when you see it. And I've only seen the movie once, so, you know, it's not something I've gone back and revisited. A number of times, but uh, mm -hmm. but you know, say la vie. It's uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to criticize you for liking it. Obviously, there are people that do, and I'm glad they do. That's that's great. I'm I'm, I'm grateful for the the uh, grateful for oh, yeah. any of the love that uh, my films get or the, my work in them. And, you know, is absolutely fine with me. It's just not I one mean, of my favorites. I mean, you worked for Anchor Bay, and they were like you know, putting out all the New World movies on DVD. You know, they and, were. They, they they put that out while I was working for them. Yeah, and this was obviously years after I had done. Uh, uh, they're playing with fire. And by the way, uh, originally it was just called Playing with Fire. Right. Uh, when we when we filmed it, and uh, then they added on the there because apparently there was some other movie called Playing with Fire. Yes, so. there was Virginia yeah. Madsen movie. I think. Uh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, my time with Anchor Bay. Now that was fun. That the year I uh, spent as their production coordinator, because yeah. uh, we got to do um, season one of um, the Masters of Horror cable series. Yeah. So, boy, in that we got to work with everybody. You know, all the great names of, uh, of horror at the time, and uh, all the great horror directors. And you know, they were all doing episodes of that and uh that was a great deal of fun because my uh, uh my the, the team that i was working with uh we created all of the bonus materials uh for the dvd release for the box sets and all that and uh so you know they, they yeah. and, you know i could have i would have paid them practically all the all the grindhouse cinema i i, I loved since i was a kid was all put out on anchor bay and i just love it it's just the most fantastic which, company which ever i didn't hear which which thing you're talking about all my favorite grindhouse movies of the 70s and 80s oh, were yeah, put out yeah, on anchor absolutely, bay absolutely absolutely yeah. by the way that's one of the things i i kind of was with thought thought was cool about the beast within is really 
Bistro then was made kind of at the tail end of that whole grindhouse period. Right. And it had some of that same grindhouse feel to it, that grittiness uh, that Texas, Texas Chainsaw and so, so many other cool films of that period had. And, uh, and by the way, here's a great story. When I was mm -hmm. in uh, Texas, uh, uh, I think it was Austin, doing uh, publicity for uh, The Beast Within, um, just as the film was being released, right. <laughs> I was at the uh, University uh, of uh, Texas at Austin, and uh, and uh, we had a lunch there, and there was a press gathering, and you know, a little press conference there. And uh, and at one point, I'm in an elevator there with with uh, a very nice guy from the. Uh, it was like the curator of the their film department, and uh, we're talking, and uh, and I find out that he played the hitchhiker. From Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it was Ed Neal. Oh, I know Ed. Yeah. Yeah, great guy. We we became friends since then, and you know we've we've over the years we've we've met many times, had lunch together. He's a great guy, very uh, very funny too. Uh, and uh, but he was like part of at one point had been part of I think the Groundlings, and you know he's great with improv and all kinds of stuff. But anyway, I meeting him there in the, in the elevator. Uh, I refuse to believe that it was him because he was nothing like the hitchhiker in the movie. You know, it's like you yeah. can't be him. Are you sure you, you, you're having me on? You trying to pull my leg with? It? And uh, and right then and there, he did the hitchhiker for me. He twisted his face up. He did that weird posture. And he, he, he he did the voice like that. You you, you, you like head cheese? I, it, it's real good. I, I make it real good. You you, you like it? You know, and I I just I just just like went oh my god it really is you that's fantastic <laughs> i couldn't believe it there i was in the elevator with the hitchhiker from texas chainsaw and then later <clears throat> when i started doing uh, a lot of horror conventions because of the beast within uh ed and some of the other actors from uh, texas chainsaw would sometimes be there as well mm -hmm. <laughs> and when we did a thing in san jose uh one of the conventions near the uh winter Chester House out there uh, in, yeah, in Northern California. Um, I wound up having probably the most memorable breakfast of my life uh, with Ed and the other cast members who are still alive then, uh, from Texas Chainsaw. Right. Uh, Jim Sidow, the, the, the cook, the yeah. father, really, he was there. Uh, John Duggan, the uh, played Grant. I know all these guys. They've uh, all been on my show. <laughs> yeah, I'll bet they have. Gunnar Hansen uh, and Sally was, okay, well, you, you must have interviewed her. Well, no, I didn't. And, <laughs> I've had Kelly. I've had Ed Gwynn, uh, Dan Zinger, uh, Terry McMinn, and um, uh, what's the other one? John Dugan, yeah. Yep, John Dugan. He was the, he was grandpa, <clears throat> and and uh, got her hands and and for heaven's sake, who's who's Sally? If she has the biggest role in the movie, practically. Marilyn, she's she's gone now. Yeah, oh, I know she passed away. What yeah. is her name? Do you remember? Marilyn Burns. There we go. Thank you, Marilyn Burns. Absolutely, she was also a sweetheart. They all were sweethearts. The whole, the whole uh, horrific uh, Texas Chainsaw Clan that could not have been uh, nicer. They were all just great people. And uh, so there I was at breakfast with with the hitchhiker, Grandpa, Leatherface, Sally. Uh, I mean, that was that was an amazing breakfast. <laughs> and um, yeah. fortunately, I I thought to bring along a rolled poster. Uh, from the film, and I had them all sign it to me. Nice. I still have it. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> so that was that was cool beans. Let me tell you. Yeah. So, so tell me about your interest in the paranormal. Like, when did that begin? Ah, uh, well, <clears throat> I've long been interested in the paranormal, just in, in terms of having had some odd experiences here and there over the years that. Uh, I could not easily explain. Um, so I was, you know, I was open-minded about it, but I wasn't convinced one way or the other. Uh, I was just curious uh, until, uh, this is before I began to actually investigate it uh, professionally, but I, um, I spent a weekend at the famously haunted Hotel Del Coronado in San Diego uh -huh. on, Cor on Coronado Island. 
uh, room uh, 502, which later was changed to room 3502, and then later to another number entirely. <clears throat> you go there now, they don't want people to know where that originally uh, haunted room uh, is because it's a rather small room. I think it used to be like a maid's room. Mm -hmm. There were two little single beds in it, and it's not a room you could charge a lot of money for, unlike this other room, which is also supposedly haunted, right. which is actually a big suite. It's a much bigger, much fancier room. But originally, the room that people wrote about in, in uh, books on the paranormal, including one by Antoinette May called The uh, Wandering Ghosts of California, <clears throat> that, that's the first book I saw that had a whole chapter devoted to room uh, then 502. Uh, and I spent uh, the night there uh, myself, alone uh, in that room, and that is the thing that absolutely convinced me of the reality of the paranormal. Uh, so many things happened, you wouldn't have believed it. It was, I began to think, was this something somebody has staged for me to make this stuff happen? I mean, it was impossible, this stuff. I mean, uh, at one point I went to grab a hold of something from a, uh, on a table, and it flew off the tabletop and sailed through the air about three feet and fell on the floor. Mm. Um, uh, the door closed and locked itself from the inside while I was out in the hall. Yeah. And I had to go get someone from downstairs to come up with a pass key to let me back into my room. Yeah. Uh, the um, uh, Just all kinds of things that happened. Sounds, strange stuff. Um, I, I took a bath at one point, and I remember I was reading Stephen King's The Stand, which is quite a hefty book in hardcover, and it was lying, I, as I started getting sleepy, I just laid it open uh, at the place I'd been reading, and I put it on the floor next to the tub, and I took a little nap, and I suddenly was awakened by a loud bang, and the sound a book makes when you slam a book closed. Uh, and I looked, and then and the, there was the book closed, no longer open. It had slammed shut. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, um, also, when I went out back into the main part of the room from the bathroom, I saw that the light was on. Well, the light was definitely off uh, when I went into the bathroom, but it was turned on. And I noticed that because this room was configured in a very strange way. You couldn't uh, easily turn on the light switch because it was behind a, a dresser mirror. You had to reach awkwardly behind this mirror to get to the light switch. And who, who did that in a room with the door locked? I mean, you had the chain on, too, so you couldn't, nobody from outside could have turned on that light. Uh, but <clears throat> the most dramatic thing was about 1130 at night, I began to hear these footsteps from the room upstairs, these heavy footsteps, like a large man, uh, and then the sounds of something being dragged, like a trunk or something, and then more footsteps and those dragging sounds. And I thought, you know, well, that's weird. Who would be moving furniture in the room upstairs late at night like that? What, you know, it's very weird. But I followed those sounds across the room and into the closet where they stopped, uh, because you can't go any further out of that closet. Uh, leads to there's a window in the closet looking into the you know the outside uh, of the of that um, the fifth floor of the building it was on the fifth floor so anyway um, it wasn't until I got back to to L A mm -hmm. from San Diego that I realized wait a minute uh, there is no fifth floor. On that, I mean, sixth floor. I thought it was the city that, that it was the you know coming from the room upstairs. Somebody dragging furniture. No, the fifth floor well, that I was in was the top floor of the hotel, and I had a photograph that I took from a window in the hallway showing the outside of my room, and you can see there's a sharply slanted or steeply slanted roof. Uh, Nobody could walk on that roof, and let alone drag furniture across it. Uh, so that really gave me the creeps. And and very soon after that, a, a psychic medium stayed in that room, and she did some automatic writing, and she got these impressions of a girl having been tied up and put in a trunk. Oh, and man. she said, someone has tied me up and put me in a trunk. I'm terrified. Help me. Please help me. And uh, 
there is this whole thing about this girl who had stayed in that room uh, and was supposedly pregnant at the time, which is why she was kind of on the run and, and uh, she was desperate. And, uh, and somehow uh, the idea or the story goes that she had been killed and then her body was buried somewhere on the uh, property of the hotel underneath what is now the swimming pool area. So there's this big concrete, you know, pool, pool area around the pool, a pool deck. And, uh, you know, nobody's going to start breaking up all that concrete, you know, thinking maybe there'll be a body under there. So um, that's, you know, that all that stuff happened to me. And uh, that really... Uh, all that different stuff, uh, you know, changed my mind on the, you know, reality of the paranormal at that point. They also did another uh, TV show where uh, um, one of those shows, I think it was called Eye on L.A., uh, their team of people stayed there all night, and they had a camera set up, a low-light camera, and uh, around about 3 in the morning, a weird greenish-blue mist this glowing mist came out from the end of the bed closest to the bathroom. It made a curve, like a question mark shape, curved around the bottom of the bed and then snaked around into the bathroom. And they showed it a few times. You really see it well. Mm. And uh, this glowing, dimly glowing, bluish green mist. So it's, you know, that room is, uh, it's got a history. And um, mm. so after that, I wound up later uh, getting involved with the... Um, investigation group uh, headed up by uh, my friend Dr. Barry Taff, a noted parapsychologist who's investigated hundreds and hundreds of cases, including the case that became the movie The Entity with Barbara Hershey. Oh, yeah. He was one of the three uh, investigators from the UCLA, at that time, the UCLA Parapsychology Department, uh, Dr. Thelma Moss and Dr. Carrie Gaynor, uh, and then Dr. Barry Taff, so the three of them. <clears throat> and um, I was actually brought into the parapsychology lab uh, uh, to be part of an experiment uh, when it was still an up and running uh, thing. It was in the it was in the basement of the neuropsychiatry, the neuropsychiatric uh, uh, building at on the uh, campus. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that building is now, but it used to house the parapsychology department, which you know is not there anymore. But uh, Gary Tapp also investigated a famous case called the San Pedro Haunting, which has been featured on any number of those ghost investigation shows. Uh, they've, uh, they've dealt with that and also a, uh, a place called the Omen House, uh, not O-M-E-N, like the movie The Omen, it's right. O-M-A-N, uh, David Omen, uh, it's named after the owner, uh, and it's right near, it's on Cielo Drive, right near where the Manson killings happened, and that place is amazingly haunted, my God, so many things happened there, and I investigated that place with the Barry Taft, I was there on about three or four occasions, uh, Lori Jacobson, she was there, oh, yeah. uh, as part of the investigation, I know you, you're, you're friends with her. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Lori's a sweet, sweet woman now battling, I know, some, uh, yes. some health the, issues. The uh, best. But, um, uh, yeah, that's where I first, uh, uh, first had met, uh, Lori and, uh, uh, the house made her feel ill at the time. Um, about half the people who uh, went there would wind up feeling so ill that they had to leave the house, and then the other half of the, pe the people wouldn't be affected by it. Luckily, I uh, was not badly affected by the house at all physically, uh, but Barry Taff was. He almost uh, passed out. Uh, he won't go back there. He, you know, he, I think he, he went there like twice, and then he said, never again. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I pay too high a price physically. It messes with... Uh, you know, his, um, uh, his organs and things. Yeah. So yeah, I wouldn't anyway. either. <laughs> I'm sorry. What? I wouldn't either. I wouldn't go back no. there either. <laughs> no, no, but, but all the famous, uh, you know, the ghost hunters, the, those guys who were plumbers, you know, who, who on, on the side, oh, they're the ones who really created the whole genre of these real life ghost investigations on TV. They were the first, uh, ghost hunters. And then of course, ghost adventures and ghost brothers and ghost this and ghost that. <laughs> you know, yeah. There's so many shows now, but a lot of those shows have, uh, done, done segments on the, uh, the Omen house and, uh, yeah, impossible crazy things happened there. I brought a, a compass with me uh, that was still in the plastic, the kind where you need a, a heavy scissors, you know, to open yeah. it up because the plastic's so damn thick. Uh, but you could see it work inside the, the, the 
plastic casing. So just to show that it, the, the, the compass, you know, could not have been tampered with. And uh, and by God, uh, that compass, when you would go from just just move like several feet in the, in the same direction, and it would be like pointing north, right? And you step out onto the balcony of the house, and suddenly the compass goes like 180 degrees until it's now pointing south. Should that should be impossible? That should not have been able to happen, but it did. There were all these weird uh, geomagnetic anomalies, uh, in, insane uh, readings uh, on the equipment. Uh, sometimes mm-hmm. the equipment would fail. Uh, it was a very weird environment, and uh, apparitions were seen. Uh, you name it, and it, it happened in that place. And uh, and then the uh, the other one I mentioned, the San Pedro haunting. That that was a. Uh, um, nothing happened while I was there on that one, even though the, the infamous attic there where a, a, a disembodied head was seen floating across the attic at, wow. the, at night. Uh, and um, uh, someone, oh yeah, a very dramatic thing happened to our crew of investigators, but not the night that I was there. But he was, he was hanged, almost killed yeah. in the attic when he was lifted off his feet by something something uh, wrapped around his neck and pulled him up. Wow. And somebody was up there with a camera with a flash, and they took several pictures of him at that moment, uh, and, and then they, they got the lights on up there, so they, they were able to... He, he, was, he was being hung on a... Uh, there was a piece of, like, white... Um, you know, insulated wire that was tied around a nail uh, on one of the beams uh, on the attic ceiling, and he had been lifted up and uh, had this thing wrapped around his neck. And when he came down from there in a total disoriented panic, uh, you could see these red welts around his neck, uh, these abrasion marks uh, from where, you know, he was hanged on this thing. He still had the, the, the piece of wire dangling from his neck at that point. I mean, they saved him. They got him down off the nail. But, you know, how, how creepy is that? Uh, usually, investigators do not get physically attacked. Uh, at least to any serious degree during an investigation of the paranormal. But in this case, that did happen. And so, among other things, that made the case rather uh, famous uh, or notorious, I guess. Wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've had... And, and uh, mm-hmm. I finally was able to uh, uh, be filmed doing a paranormal investigation on TV, not for a ghost, not for a ghost hunters program, but for the Halloween episode of um, the Playboy uh, um, Hugh Hefner show called uh, The Girls Next Door, uh, which followed the uh, adventures of, of Hef and his uh, three blonde girlfriends, uh, Bridget, Kendra, and Holly. And uh, Barry Taff and I were called there to do a ghost investigation of the Playboy Mansion because right. of some odd things that had been happening to the girls, and in particular, uh, Bridget. Well, we determined through you know the day and evening that we spent there uh, with the various equipment that we were using that the, our best our best feeling was that the, the house itself was not the source of the what was going on there. That the, in other words, that the, the Playboy Mansion itself was not haunted, but that Bridget who in her life had had a lot of weird paranormal things uh, happening around her, we felt that she was actually the focus of this because the odd readings that we would get were in proximity to her, not the other girls and not elsewhere in the house. So we really thought that, uh, that really it centered, uh, it was, you know, centered on uh, Bridget. And interestingly, uh, later, she wound up doing a uh, podcast very successfully that still might be going for all I know. I haven't checked recently, but uh, it's called uh, Bridget Marquant Ghost Magnet. Uh, she was a ghost magnet, I'll tell you. Uh, and uh, I was a guest on her show on, uh, I think, three or four different occasions and uh, doing uh, her, her podcast. And... Uh, a really spectacular thing that I saw in a, um, it used to be, it was an, an all night, I don't think it's all night anymore, but it was a, mm-hmm. at that time it was an all night uh, copy shop, you know, a photocopy place. And uh, a very good close friend of mine at that time was the uh, night manager of the place. And its 
really haunted to this day. I've talked to many people that have worked there, and uh, everybody has stories. And uh, boy, I had several instances there. I saw an apparition of a man looking like he came out of the 1940s wearing a long coat and hat of that time period, and I saw him pass by this pillar, and then as he emerged on the other side, he just dissolved into nothing. Wow. Uh, I heard women talking at night in this one part of the uh, uh, of the place near the uh, restroom. Uh, while I was in the restroom, I heard this music, like Muzak playing, uh-huh. and then these two women having a conversation, and I'd come out of the bathroom, and the music would immediately stop, and the voices would disappear. But there was no one there at that time but me and my friend who was, you know, working behind the counter doing his, uh, his uh, you know, uh, copy shop stuff. So, um, but the most dramatic thing, and both of us witnessed this at the same time, we saw this full-size trash can, not a little wastebasket, a big, weight, big trash can, a plastic trash can, suddenly fly up into the air about five or six feet into the air, turn on its side, and then fall back down again. Mm-hmm. Wow. God. Uh, yeah. The creepiest thing, that, that that was spectacular. More than creepy, it was it was like, wow. You know, you see that, it's like, oh my God. It was just like, that's incredible. I took a picture, but the picture, probably the picture was of the, the can lying on its side <clears throat> on the floor. I did not obviously have a camera ready uh, thinking this thing was going to go flying in the air and turn on its side and fall again. But um, one of the creepiest things that happened to someone who worked there was when they saw uh, the the these metal uh, blinds of the manager's office, the, and the office was closed and locked at this time. There was nobody in there, but they saw those 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 blinds kind of open up. They were they were not vertical blinds. They were the the horizontal blinds, and and they kind of buckled in the middle and opened up, and you could see the darkness in there as if somebody in there were opening the blinds and and peeking out. Uh, into the store, and they sort of froze when they saw that, and then they saw the blinds slowly come back together again. That would have freaked me so much. Yeah. (laughs) And the manager of the store, one night, she came out of her office, and she saw a guy back where the public is not allowed, where only the people that work there are allowed to be working with some of that equipment, Um, and she starts to walk across the the floor uh, to towards this person, and she's just telling this guy, excuse me, sir, you're not allowed to be back here. And as soon as she starts talking to this guy, he dissolved into nothing. And she got so freaked, uh, she turned around, ran into her office, closed the door, and <laughs> that, that was it. <laughs> I, think, I think that was it for the night for her. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So what, so what you got going on these days? Uh, well, I, I was... For um, some period of time, I was working on, this is for, I don't know, some years, about six years or so, uh, I did a short film. I played the leading role in an award-winning short film, which became an internet phenomenon. Uh-huh. Uh, first of all, it won uh, about 20 different uh, film festival awards, uh-huh. uh, internationally and nationally. Uh, we won the uh, uh, Fantasia Fest uh, in Canada, their award for the best short film of the year. Uh, many, many other awards. We won the best short film of the year from uh, Rue Morgue magazine. Uh, and uh, so aside from the 20 festival awards, once it was put onto YouTube, uh, it, just, it, it suddenly became viral. It went crazy. And uh, now at this point in time, uh, that one video has 37 million views. Nice. Uh, the title of it is The Horribly Slow Murderer with the Extremely Inefficient Weapon. And uh, in it, I play a forensic pathologist named Jack Luchayo, uh-huh. who uh, is, becomes the victim of a supernatural curse <clears throat> that manifests itself in the form of this gaunt, hooded demon, or wearing a kind of a, a, a modern-day black hoodie, yeah. and black pants, and uh, whose face is ghoulish white with circle, dark circles around the eyes and black lips, and uh, played by a very talented uh, actor named Brian Rohan. 
uh, and written and directed by a very talented guy uh, named Richard Gale, who also did a uh, real white knuckle horror film called uh, uh, Criticized, uh-huh. also a short film which won many festival awards, uh, and. Uh, but uh, that film, even though it has a little bit of black humor in it, is not exactly what you call funny. It's uh, quite a horrific thing. You can see it on YouTube in its entirety, uh, criticized, <laughs> which also stars Brian Rohan, who plays this. The, he plays the demon in uh, The Horribly Slow Murderer. But this demon, the demon is called the Ginosaji. Uh, and that is, uh, Ginosaji is Japanese for silver spoon, because the the... The extremely <laughs> inefficient weapon of the title mm-hmm. uh, is actually a, a spoon, a teaspoon. And this demon pursues me literally to the ends of the earth, uh, hitting me thousands of times with a spoon. Uh-huh. So it's the, it is the world's slowest murder. <laughs> Mm. And and uh, the, the film is extremely elaborate. Uh, we got we had the use of a tank from Desert Storm at one point. I, mean, I I use every weapon known to man to try to stop this 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 demon. Uh-huh. And whatever I try, nothing works because he's invulnerable. So it's kind of like a real life version of the Road Runner and the Coyote. Well, this became so popular that it spawned a uh, a web series, and we probably did about. 30 or 35 uh, um, episodes uh, very elaborately done uh, of those characters in that situation but but we took it further and further and made it you know more and more um, uh, almost sort of Lynchian really in parts of it became Mary David Lynchian yeah. and uh, sort of funny but 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 you know really twisted and strange and uh and um then there was a a kickstarter campaign uh to raise the funding to turn it into a feature film now immediately you'd ask how do you make a feature film about somebody being hit with a spoon thousands of times and chased all the all over the world (laughs) well the director was very clever he also wrote it and he 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 turned it into uh actually a wonderful screenplay and uh with a real story and you know a complex background and so it's not just a one joke premise by any means and neither was the web series I mean, we did so many things with it but uh to expand on that uh, you know concept but uh the uh, a tragedy unfortunately happened in uh, richard's life uh, as we concluded the successful Kickstarter campaign. We raised the money, we were successful, and uh, and he was beginning to make preparations to go further with it, and his father suddenly passed away. Uh, and, um, and he had to go to Florida, where his parents were living, and uh, and is still there taking care of his um, his ailing mother. Uh, now that uh, his father is no longer there, and uh, so uh, everything has had you know, naturally to be put on the back burner, uh, because of the tragedy. And, um, you know, eventually, uh, the plan is to get back, uh, to that project again. But, you know, right now, um, you know, he has got to be there for his mom and I was there for my mom in her later years, you know, helping to take care of her. And, you know, so, uh, nothing's more important than that. Did, Did your mom like your acting career? Oh, very much so. She was very supportive of it. I mean, she didn't love everything I did equally. I mean, I mean, she recognized that the beast within, she liked me in it. She felt, she, you know, she appreciated my performance, but, you know, uh, violent horror is not exactly, you know, that, that was not her. Of course, her of that generation. <laughs> Yeah, not of that generation, of course. Yeah, exactly. But no, she was, but she was, you know, very supportive of, uh, you know, a lot of the work that I had done. And when I did uh, my uh, one man show uh, uh, on Edgar Allan Poe, um, uh-huh. Once Upon a Midnight, uh, which I co-wrote with uh, Ron McGid, um, that uh, you know, I did that for uh, quite a while. I had a four-month run in uh, Hollywood, uh, and then after that, I did it at various other venues, and uh, and then I got busy doing other things, and <clears throat> it got put onto the, the back burner with me for a while. And during that time, I ran into uh, John Aston, who, as you recall, I went to school with two of his sons, yep. and uh, um, it we started talking and. 
John was mentioning he was wanting to develop a one-man uh, play uh, about one of several different uh, literary figures, and uh, one of them was Poe. And I said, hey, hey, stop right there. I've got exactly what you're looking for. And uh, my writing partner and I got in the uh, screenplay, uh, I mean, uh, stage play, not screenplay. And uh, he read it, loved it, he optioned it, and uh, he, he did the play for the next 10 years uh, all, over the, all over the place. He did it in uh, Ireland, Scotland, Australia, and all over the U.S. for, for 10 years, very successfully. Uh, but uh, so uh, in the process of uh, researching uh, the play when I was first uh, writing it with Ron McGid, I became a uh, Poe scholar. Um, and actually, I began collecting Poe when I was about, oh, 14 years old. And then I never stopped. And uh, I just kept collecting and collecting. And now I have uh, a probably the largest Poe research collection in private hands uh, uh, probably anywhere. Uh, I mean, outside of a university or a public library in terms of that, in private hands. Um, and uh, so, uh, and I've been in a number of documentaries about Poe, um, the, the A&E biography episode. I'm all through that one. It's one of the talking heads. Uh, I also helped uh, get another recent Poe documentary going, uh, uh, done by a, a, a WGBH, I think it's called in, in Boston. They're, they're whatever the public uh, television uh, station in Boston is. They they did a uh, thing for PBS there uh, called Edgar Allan Poe Buried Alive, uh, and um, uh, you know I my name is on that as having uh, you know helped to develop that. I helped get the uh, uh, development grant, the uh, research grant uh, from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, I'm one of uh, Two people. They, well, it was a, originally it was going to be the producer of the documentary, and then sadly he uh, he unexpectedly had a, a, a heart attack and passed away. Uh, then it got that got put on the back shelf for a little while, and then uh, a new team was assembled, and uh, they did actually wind up. Uh, doing it with uh, Dennis O'Hare, uh, mm. who played the Vampire King of Louisiana in uh, in uh, that TV series about vampires with uh, Skarsgård, the brother of, um, you know the name of that one? It had a one-word title, I think. Uh, no, no, I remember. It's True Blood. Oh, True, true Blood, yeah, yeah. True, true Blood. Well, That's uh, two words. <laughs> O'Hare, wonderful actor who played uh, the, the Vampire King of Louisiana and played many roles in uh, American Horror Story, the TV series. Well, he was a very, very good uh, Poe uh, in that. And then I became the artistic advisor uh, to the another one-man Poe production uh, called Nevermore, <laughs> uh, which was uh, brilliantly uh, acted by... Um, uh, Jeffrey Combs. Oh, yeah. Uh, who's now my pal. I know Jeff. And, uh, I'm sorry, what? I know Jeff. I've met him once. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Great, great guy and uh, incredibly versatile actor. And uh, and then, of course, directed by Stuart Gordon and uh, the great, the late, great Stuart Gordon. Who was a, who One of my favorite guy. horror movies of very, all time, by the way. Very talented. Oh, well, God. Uh, a reanimator. You know, who doesn't yeah. love that? I mean, if you're a horror fan, which I am, <laughs> you yep. love that. And uh, and a number of other things that they did together, of course, from Beyond, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, but Stewart directed it, the, the uh, stage play, uh, Nevermore, and it was written by uh, Dennis Paoli, who uh, of course wrote Reanimator yep. and uh, from Beyond. Yep. And uh, uh, that was a wonderful. Um, oh, in fact, uh, they, the first thing they did about Poe was uh, the Black Cat oh, yeah. uh, for Masters of Horror. Uh, directed by Stuart Gordon, and in which Jeffrey Combs—that's when he first played Poe—was in that, and uh, and so then uh, you know later, as I said, I became an artistic advisor to that uh, that stage production, which ran for like two years in uh, at a small theater in L.A., the, the Steve Allen Theater. I don't think it's there anymore, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it ran for yeah, about two years, and uh, I, I think I saw it probably like 35 or 40 times uh, to give my notes and you know I, I you know was very gratified that well they flipped out when they you know 
saw my some items in my Poe collection, and I uh, was you know talking to them about my work with Poe and having done originally my play and then becoming a Poe scholar, and then all the documentaries I was in about Poe and so forth. So they they brought me aboard, and uh, um, uh, that was a wonderful experience. And uh, yeah, so you should, you should write a well, memoir. You got great stories. <laughs> yeah, well, you're right. I should write. I, I someday I know I, I've got to write uh, a memoir. Uh, got to, got to do my. Uh, we got to put those memories down on uh, paper. Yeah, for well, sure. Well, Paul, this has been such a great honor. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing all these great stories. And I hope you write that the, memoir. The honor is all mine, my friend. Well, the honor is all mine. I, I, I cut you off. What were you going to say? <laughs> Yeah, I hope you write that memoir, and I hope uh, your next projects, you know, come to full wishin and have a happy holiday season and be safe out there. You too, my friend. Happy ha- Halloween, which it almost is. Yep. And happy Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. How about they all kind of come together? <laughs> so there, okay. there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, much. my friend. I appreciate it. I had a great time. All, all right. right, my friend. I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks, Tommy. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Paul Clemens. Ain't he a cool dude? Man, what a bundle of energy. A lot of great stories there. That paranormal shit, man, rendered me speechless in case you didn't hear. Oh, man, I was just shocked, you know. I wish I could have told him, you know, my stuff, but maybe next time, you know. And plus, you know, he and I can always DM each other on Facebook. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying... There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes!